don't know. Woo! This your talk here. Here with my main man, Devin Gonzalez of Tacos El Precioso, out here in Oakland, California, representing. We over here drinking mezcal. What are we drinking on, Chef? Uh, we're drinking La Mata. It's uh, Verde from Durango. Uh, it's one of my favorites that I have at the house. It's formerly Amor Mata, but now it's La Mata. It's a uh, very green uh, kind of floral flavor and stuff. One of my amigas, she calls it La Iguana. Yeah. But uh, it's, from, <laughs> it's from Durango. It's hella good. It's one of my favorites. So. Love that. Love that. Well, yo, thanks for bringing it on. Thanks for fucking contacting me about a podcast. Um, Oakland is a great city. You've been doing your thing now for about five years, correct? Yeah. yeah. All right. Very cool. Uh, so we'll get into that. Um, but, you know, here on Sucio Talk, we're going to go all the way back. Let's so uh, where were you born? I was born in Dallas, Texas, and uh, I was born and raised there. Uh, my family immigrated uh, to to the states uh from nuevo leon it's like the northern part of mexico right and stuff and so my abuelito brought you know uh my abuelita and my mom and my tias to texas and you know there I, here i go here you are <laughs> yeah here i am all right um when you uh let's let's skip forward a little bit when you went to open this taqueria did your parents were like what do you what the fuck are you doing or were they like let's do it um I mean, really, like, my abuelito, he's still alive. Uh, his name is Timoteo. And, um, you know, I told him, I was like, hey, I want to open this taco business mm -hmm. and stuff. And one of the first things that he told me is like, yo, I didn't come all the way to this country to, <laughs> to sacrifice so yeah. much for my family and leave my family, you know, back in Mexico so that you could sell tacos. And I was like, yo, like, what I'm doing is different. It's not like every taqueria on the corner. Uh -huh. It's like a different vibe. And stuff and so it wasn't until he came out here uh, a couple months after I started uh, with my brother and saw what I was doing and I did a party uh, for some homies and he came and like watched me work and saw what I was serving and he right. was like, alright well this is different and then mm -hmm. saw like you know I was you know my house was clean and you know just like everything was okay and, and your shit together yeah have my shit together and yeah. stuff as you know as best as one could got you so then i well, got the approval <laughs> <laughs> well i think sometimes abuelitos too look at you like uh you know they look at you when they're a little kid and forever you'll always be that person oh yeah you know so yeah. they're like what the fuck is that coolie cagao que, que le va a ser? you yeah. know what i mean yeah. like you, so you got to prove them wrong a little bit yeah in order to, to yeah. get it's or like my like, family with cooking yeah same shit. it's like you got to make your place in the world yeah so they were just like of all the things you've done in your life like you're gonna go make tacos and i was like yo like i'm gonna try this out and if it doesn't work out i'll go cook again or go be a cook at a restaurant or go be a chef again yeah yeah dope so. dope man well um fucking born born raised here right um what was your upbringing like what were you eating eating at home yeah going out? I mean, so like in so i was born and raised in in texas and uh you know people ask like you know if i'm from here or if i'm from mexico or whatever and i just it's joke. a fucking bullshit answer that you have to Give, man well i just joke with them that i'm tejano right? yeah <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> you know because like all my primos we go to mexico and you know it's like when and in texas too like texas is hella racist so right and you're like okay well you know when you're when you're in, in texas it's like okay well you're mexican even though you're born in texas but then you go to mexico and you go see all your mocoso as primos and they're like oh pues you're not one of us porque eres allá i'm like yo my abuelito is your dad's brother yeah like, we're same family. shit yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's wild. I hear you, man. It's like you're not, you're not like, you don't belong. Yeah. Because it's like you're not Mexican enough. You're not white enough. You're not black enough. You're not nothing enough. You're yeah. like, I don't know what to do. Yeah, that you know? whole like identity thing. As yeah, well. for sure. But, for sure. Uh, but yeah, man, like growing up, you know, my abuelita would make, you know, she would make like chile colorado. She would make mole with like the mole in like the little jar. Yeah. It was hella funny. Um, but my abuelito is from, uh, you know, this town outside of Monterrey called mm. General Bravo. And, uh, you know, he grew up on a, on a farm and he would have to go watch goats. And that was his job. He like only he stopped going to school like in third grade. OK. And so he loved like cabrito. And so we would always be eating like cabrito or like, you know, grilled goat or like something like you know, the, And then like on Sundays he would make men, menudo a lot. Right. What's some? Oh, and then 
one of my abuelita's friends was actually Salvadorian, and so that lady, we would always be eating pupusas too. Really? Yeah. So then okay. my abuelita learned how to make pupusas, but she wouldn't make them by hand. She would actually use like the tortilla press and like press the tortilla and then put like the meat and the cheese and then like another tortilla and then they would like pinch it down around oh, the edges. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But yeah, hella tamales. Uh, I like that though. No rules. Yeah. You know, because then you just eat yeah. instead of being like, oh, well, you know, it's not traditional. It's like, oh, bro, at this, at this day and age, fuck traditional. Yeah. Like we, it obviously doesn't work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But uh, that's cool, man. Yeah. Um, Going out to eat was like, Going to Burger King, dollar menu. Yeah, Jack, baby. Jack in a box, that's dollar right. menu. We could never get a drink because we always had, you know, baby, that's in la casa. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> wait, it's like, why we got to eat here then, bro? Yeah. Like, wait, you're, you're all like choking and shit. Yeah. They're like, what? Well, keep like a boy a jugar. You can yeah. play in the fucking playscape. Yeah. Dale. Yeah. Don't get lost. A little playscape uh, a fucking hack here. If you take the little bandejas, the trays, yeah. you can fucking fly down those slides, bro. We would get to the point where we'd be sliding into the tables. Like, it was dangerous, you know. But definitely for you kids out there, check it out. Um, but I think we should t- take, a, take a sip. Cheers, man. Thanks Cheers, for bro. having me. Of course. Oh. Ooh, yeah, daddy. Mezcal, uh, an alcohol that you grew up with in your family? No, man. Um, growing up, my abuelito would drink Presidente um, and, like, Bud Light. Yeah. Like, it was a celebration. It would be Presidente. If it was, like, a cookout, it would be Bud Light. Right. And then my mom would, like, you know, drink wine a lot. But okay. yeah, I didn't really get into Mezcal or, like, really get into it uh, up until probably the last five years, I would say. Got you. Got you. Yeah. Did the, the restaurant inspire that? That learning curve? Well, so the restaurant, you know, we're we're doing food at this new spot uh, here in Oakland. Uh, We just opened up about two months ago, but I really, I would say, grew an affinity for Mezcal uh, going down to Oaxaca with uh, some friends. Uh, Her family lived down there, and so we went, and her tío would make a a tobala, which is like a varietal of Mezcal. Mm -hmm. It was was my – I was like, yo, I've never had anything like this before, and I think, you know, I had like a – just – ignorant or uneducated perspective on mezcal it was like oh this is just like tequila and stuff and like yeah. her tío like really showed me like yo this there's a lot to learn about this stuff mm-hmm. and so just like in the past you know few years um i've just really grow to enjoy it yeah and stuff and it's yeah. my i've it's also my spirit grown to enjoy it and it's become my spirit of choice it used to be rum for me just because you know portojo pero like when i did the road trip man every bar had a mezcal cocktail and so usually if I find like there's a trend somewhere, I'll just try it everywhere I go. Yeah. And man, I was never upset with my cocktail. Like yeah. mezcal is a beautiful, beautiful cocktail spirit. Yeah, it's delicious. Yeah, for sure. Um, so fucking born and raised in Texas. So what did you do in school? You play any sports or anything? Um, yeah, in school, you know, growing up in Texas, you like either have to like play football or like be in the band right. or something that like supports football. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like, it's a joke. It's like, uh, you know, football, football's first. Yeah. It's like football, Texas, God, and then country. I think right, it's like right. the order of importance. Uh, so I played football. Why do you um, think that is? Do you I think it's because it's so big that you're alienated from the rest of the United States? Like, why do I think? Why do you think Texas has such like a pride Man. Of like that spirit, like their football, like they take shit seriously. Everything. I dated a Texan, and it was like that's all I heard about every fucking day. Yeah. By the way, I'm from Texas. Like yeah. I know, I know. You never <laughs> let me forget it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, that's a good question, man. I think, I think like the history of Texas, they just went through so much. I mean, they had like six different, you know, almost like occupations. You know, they were like the people that live there on the land and then with Spain and with Mexico and with, you know, then Texas was its own thing. And Mm -hmm. then with the U S and, you know, I don't know if it's some of that, but it's, it's so wild. It's like, like if the United States or like being an American was like, I don't know, condensed or concentrated, like it's Texas. Yeah. Like people from Texas are, they will tell you that they are Texan before they are an American. Yeah, exactly. It's fucking crazy. I don't, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. because you don't get that in other states no nobody's like i'm californian well like in california for example like you don't 
everyone doesn't have a California flag in front of their house. Very true. Very in, true. In Texas, everyone has a fucking Texas flag <laughs> or that like metal star yeah. like on the front of their house. It's just like, yo, dog, is this so you don't forget where yeah. you live? Like, what the fuck? I can't hate on that because, you know, Puerto Ricans, man, that should be on the car, the boxing gloves, yeah. the house, the shirt, yeah. the do-rag. So I can't hate on them for having their flag, but... It's God wild, damn. Man. I will say, though, something that's nice about Texas is uh, the size of the roads and, like, the neighborhoods. Yeah. It's, like, comfortable. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you go to the northeast, it's, like, fucking one ways and shit, and you're like, what is this? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, cool, man. So you grew up, and, and did you do band or, or? No, I played you football. Do? You played football. Yeah, I played football in, in Texas, and uh, I started when I was, like, in fifth grade. Right. I actually started, I played baseball for a year. But then my mom had to work a lot, and I only went to, like, half the games and stuff. And then one of the friends I went to school with, elementary school, he played football. And so he was like, yo, if you want to go, like, my mom can pick you up, and then we can just go, right. like, to practice and stuff. And mm-hmm. so I was like, all right. So I started playing football and stuff in the depth for a few years and, you know, just definitely got my fair share, I think, of, like, early or prepubescent concussions oh yeah and all that stuff but uh how'd they treat that in high school like i mean it was just like like like, did you know you were concussed or was it like no shake it off yeah they're just like oh walk it off it's like all right yeah i think i probably had if i had to guess probably like eight or ten concussions really like from the time i was like in fifth grade to high school Mm -hmm. what position you play um i played uh defensive back or like a linebacker and then i played uh offensive line depending on the grade and school and size yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) i hear you i hear you um you play with anybody that made it to the the big leagues uh i don't think so okay yeah cool heard that yeah (laughs) um so uh when you're about to get out of high school like what's your first job uh my first job uh, I actually started working construction with my abuelito. So mm-hmm. even when I was uh, when I was in middle school, so like every Saturday uh, and every summer, I'd go work with him. So I started like carrying the blueprints. Like he had a construction and framing business, so then I would be like carrying like the ropes and like the compressor hoses and all that stuff, and like unloading the trucks and like setting up help setting up the job site. And we would like pop all the lines, like the red chalk lines for the building. Right. And shit, and so that was my first job, I think, like, at 13, but even before that, like, me and my brother would go hustle in the neighborhood, we would, like, uh, we would take the lawnmower and, like, go right, cut right, the right, right, classic, back. classic, yeah, we yeah. would do that, like, wash the neighbor's cars, mm-hmm. and then we got saved up money to buy uh, a, po- a power washer, and then we started, like, power washing the people, the neighbor's houses, and, like, oh, the, dope. their driveways and shit, so we could, so like, you're always money. making money, yeah, okay, because, like, we wanted bikes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And stuff and like, love that. And your parents they, were like, "You want it? Go work for you it." You gotta go figure it out. Dope, dope, so. man. That's a great upbringing. Yeah. Great upbringing. <laughs> I wish more people had yeah. that shit. Yeah, I think my first, not I think my first job, like, not working with my family was when I was uh, sixteen. Actually, I worked at REI in Dallas. You worked at REI. Yeah, selling like camping stuff. Yeah, yeah. Because I went actually went to military. I got sent to military school, and uh, we started this like camping. And like backpacking club, so we could like get the fuck away from school, right, 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 and like go hike and do all this other shit. And so when I came back after the first year after we started that shit, uh, I went to go work at REI. That was oh, like right. my first job at first at 15 regular or job, 16. yeah. And yeah. The, and all the kids there are like, this guy used to work construction. What the <laughs> fuck? Like it's a, like it's a grown ass man right here, bro. God damn. Yeah. So how was working at REI? Is that uh, sweet. Uh, you know, it's not, it wasn't what it is now. Right. No. I mean, they've been around for a long time, but yeah. it was, it was tight. I mean, I didn't save any money cause all the money that I, I made, I bought for camping shit. Right, right, right. I thought I was going to go back to military school. And so for me, it was like a way of getting out or being to like escape for a minute. Yeah. What was the, the military school? reasoning um were you fucking up in school yeah and your i was just like, like a piece of shit <laughs> yeah and, you know i was like fi- i had like or i have like adhd and yeah. my parent my family didn't know it at the time and i was just like always fight, no one did fighting and stealing shit and just like you know basically it was either like 
go to military school or I probably like would have went to juvie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So better choice, better choice yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um so you're sixteen working at REI, you don't go back to military school. <laughs> no. So what do you what's going on after you like leave high uh high school? Is it a pressure to go to college from your parents? Uh no. I just uh just like growing up I had like no like real stability and uh you know I went to I went to eight different schools from like kindergarten to high school. I went to two elementary schools, two middle schools, and four different high schools. Damn, boy. Because, like, my family would move around, and then, like, I didn't get – in high school, like, I wasn't getting along with my mom. And so, like, I went to go – I went to school in Arizona for a year. Okay. And then, like, my stepdad, his job was, like, going to move him or his contract was going to end or some shit. So I went back to Texas. And then by – when I was – it was still in Dallas, but then my family had moved, and so I went to, like, another high school. So it was, like, every year, year and a half, just, like – starting over yeah yeah so wow so wow okay so um you said you had a friend that you uh did football with did that did moving around so much kind of affect your friendships yeah i mean essentially like every time i had to start over yeah yeah you know yeah because back in the day there wasn't no cell phones or like you know keeping in touch no you know what i mean yeah, yeah. so damn it was hard yeah i went to I had like two or three friends from elementary school that I stayed friends with through yeah. through high school and shit. But yeah, man, every year, every year and a half, like just had to start over. Heard that. So, Heard that shit. It was hard. Yeah. So when you finally get out of high school, what do you what are your plans? Um, Freedom. Yeah. I mean, the summer after high school, uh, me and my mom got into a huge ass fight, uh, and she kicked me out of the house. And I went to community college or like enroll in community college and stuff. And I went to go live with my abuelitos and stuff for like a year. And then um, there were some people that I had met through some like local like Latino organizations at some of the other colleges. Right. And stuff. And I became friends with this other fool and like moved in with him. And uh, it was my roommate like in college and stuff. And um, yeah, just like I ended up getting a job. Uh, actually at a bank and uh, I got recruited cause I was working at Blockbuster and stuff and, um, fucking started working in banking and then started like taking more like finance and business classes and that kind of shit. Yeah. And was like, yo, like this is, I was the one thing I was really good at always in school was math. Okay. So, you know, I don't know what it was about math, but I was good at it and I could focus and stuff on that. It's shit. The only thing that could, that could keep your attention. Yeah. That's cool, man. And, uh, yeah, so I did that and then worked at a couple different banks. Um, and then that's how I ended up in California. Right. Like I transferred, uh, for the bank I used to work for. What's the bank? Uh, it, they're not around anymore, but right. it was called Wachovia. Oh, Wachovia? Uh, Fuck yeah, yeah baby. Oh, yeah, from the East Coast. Connecticut, yeah. Yeah. son. <laughs> yeah, so they failed. Uh, of course they did. Yeah, it was sure. first union before that, I think. Yeah, yeah they had like bought yeah. a whole bunch of. Yeah, because I remember my mom had the that bank, and then it changed names like fifteen times. Now yeah. it's Bank of America, I think. Uh, <laughs> it's like Wells Fargo. Yeah, or or that yeah, one, right? Yeah. yeah. Fucking corrupt bastards that have all our money. Yeah, um, <laughs> but yeah, so I was able to move to San Diego um, because I transferred, uh -huh. um, and just kind of never really looked back. What's it like working at a bank? Like, I mean, are you counting with, fucking millions of dollars? Have no, you seen a million dollars? Uh, I have not seen a million dollars on paper. I've seen it on the computer. <laughs> yeah. <but> it's. <laughs> I think uh, we all have. I type it every morning, and I'm like, that's it, baby. <laughs> yeah. That's it. This is the so one. Close. <laughs> so close. But, uh, no, man, it was, it was wild. Like, I mean, I started out as a teller, and then, you know, um, it's just – it's really weird, man. Like, the – one of the last jobs I had in San Diego in banking, I worked at this private bank, um, and I was hella young, you know, I had no kids, no mortgage, making decent money, and, I mean, we were just, like, wild out. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, we'd just be out, That's just be right. drinking, mm -hmm. like, going to happy hours, and, I mean, damn near, it felt like every day. So, bankers get after it. Yeah. yeah. Even though they look all nice and well-to-do behind that bulletproof glass. I mean, I wasn't, like, the bankers of the 80s, like, you know just being snorting crazy. cocaine off no, of me. No, no. <laughs> like counting money hold on bro yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, different, different vibe yeah but it was wild like some of the richest people that we dealt with like were the nicest people mm -hmm. um and just like you would never expect that these people were millionaires right like the people that 
own Costco, like we're our clients, like right. just crazy shit at this private bank in La Jolla. And, um, that's wild, but it was wild. Like, you know I mean? Like every day you have to like wake up, like throw a suit on, go just like go be on yeah. and stuff. And you know, what was the just, account balance on that? Uh, Costco people. I mean, there's, there's a, lot, a lot of commas. Billions? A lot of zeros, a lot of commas. Love that. But, Love that. I mean, uh, so it was, it was wild, man. Um, let's rewind, too. You worked at Blockbuster. Yeah. That's fucking classic. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, R- RIP Blockbuster. Do you still have the fucking uniform? I don't. If you did, you could have sold that shit for so much money. I mean, I think. The <laughs> size I was then and the size I was now, I would be like a, like a tube top. Yeah. So, I love it, bro. Yeah. What up? That, dude. Up, blockbuster. What was, was your good. position? Like cashier or rewinder? Uh, just like cashier, and then I would like uh, like sell movies and like movie passes and shit yeah. like that. So, like, try to sell, like, memberships and sell popcorn and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's fucking nuts. Oh, so yeah. there's an incentive to sell shit? Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Yeah. So there would be, like, these movie passes where people would have to buy them to... They're monthly uh, subscriptions, right? Yeah, exactly. Where you could, like, get so many rentals a month. Yep, yep, or yep. Some shit like that. I remember that. Then Hollywood Video came along, and they, like, kind of... Just buy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But, yeah, this lady who was a customer, I was always talked to her about movies and shit, and she was like, yo, you're, like hella good at sales and i was like thanks she's like i'm a recruiter for bank of america like you should come work for us it was just like as a teller and i was like fuck it damn i I could get health benefits based off your merits selling video passes that's crazy good for you bro i was personable and yeah you know i've had like other sales jobs you know in the food world scouted and so i was like yeah you know that's dope man i mean maybe it was just like a combination of like always having to make new friends and like just trying to like engage and talk to people yeah and it's i think it's helped me get to where i am today for sure dude <laughs> it's like being a kind person will get you way farther than anything else you yeah know what i'm saying um dope so when do you decide to get out of banks when does that happen for you um it happened when i was living in san diego uh i was like uh, still like early 20s and um i the last job that i had i had to travel like every week for work um i worked for this um this firm that i would have to go and do data samples of like the number of people coming into banks and like why they were coming in and track this stuff and ultimately what the data was being used for was for like for an automated like staffing model right for this bank i worked for mm-hmm. so that they didn't have to like replace employees um, because they were trying to migrate everybody to ATMs yeah. and away from coming in. And so that's why you probably go to different branches now of banks. And it's like there's like 20 spots for tellers, but there's only like two people right? and stuff. And so initially I didn't really understand what all this data was for. And then like, So do you think banks uh, had the idea that ATMs would just cover everything? A majority of it. Right. Like even to this day, like when people come in to go into banks, they try to escort you like, oh, why don't we go do this together like at the ATM? Right, right, it's right. Like, well, I want to see a person. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, be- oh, but you could do this at the oh, ATM. Oh, that's right. Because you- it saves them labor. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you were in the in that time where you saw people being like, I want to talk to a real person. Where like ATMs were like weird still. You know I mean, I mean? kind of. They were like good for getting cash out. But then like some of these banks were like rolling out things where then you could make deposits and you could make payments. And right, all right, right, right. Before all ATMs did was just put money out. Right. And so they were trying to migrate to save labor and like not have to replace employees like after they would quit or be fired or be promoted or whatever. So it was like this automated staffing model and there some shit happened like that. And then some stuff with. I went to a, I was trying to go to a friend's wedding and like, if I didn't complete the full weeks of like data samples, Uh like I wouldn't get paid for the week. Right. So it was like part of my contract. And so I couldn't get someone to cover on my team this one week. And I was trying to go to Ohio for my homie's wedding and he was getting married on a Friday. And I tried for like five weeks to get this week covered and stuff. And then, you know, finally the week came and the, the, the branch that I was at was just like being hella annoying. And I and because every week I'd have to go to a different city, I'd go to a different city and go to a different branch and take these data samples. Close or flying all over the country. Really? So it just like killed my social life. Um, and essentially, I would like fly home like on a Friday night or on a Saturday morning. Right. Go drop off my suits at the cleaners, and then the next day like fly out again to the new city. 
Mm -hmm. And so I did that for like a year. And then finally I wanted to go to my friend's wedding and, um, I was like, fuck this. Right. And so I ended up taking all my, I took my computer and all my files and all this shit, like took it to FedEx, like put the address of our company, like gave this box a kiss goodbye. And I was like, yo, like this life for me is over. Okay. Just like didn't want to fucking do it anymore. Gotcha. And then you went to that wedding and had the best time of your life or it was, what? It was hella good. I never, and yeah. we was in Cleveland, Ohio. And, uh, yeah, it was my friend's wedding. We had a great time and, uh, I don't regret it at all. Oh man. Yeah. So then you get out of that, you get after the wedding. What are you, what are you doing now? Um, back to San Diego yeah, to figure yeah. it out. Yeah. I went back to San Diego to figure it out. I had some cool roommates at the time. And like mm. the fun thing that we would always do is we would have people over at the house and we would cook for them mm. and stuff. And so, you know, we'd like, or we would just have cookouts and, you know, like, one of the guys, uh, he was uh, Filipino and black, and then the his wife was Filipino, um, and and I think Japanese or something. But they just like would always have hella family around and have just hella cookouts, and just like the nicest fucking people. Right. And so I was, I just like loved just being around hella people, and we would just make a bunch of food. And I took a couple months to like figure out what I wanted to do, and it just like finally clicked. Like I wanted to cook. Mm -hmm. Like I, even when I like worked in banking, like when we would go out, we'd go to the bars, like we wouldn't go out to eat afterwards. Mm -hmm. Like everybody would come to our apartment and like I would cook. So like one, two in the morning, we'd have like six, eight, 10, 15 people at the house and I'd just be cooking in the kitchen. Okay. Like, you know, just like migas or, you know, just whatever we had, we'd just be cooking right. and stuff. And so I was like, this is what I want to do. Mm hmm and so I ended up somebody that I worked with at the bank, his roommate owned this catering company in San Diego. And so I kept bugging him to let me like to like let me work for him and shit. And he just kept being like, you know, you don't have any experience, you don't have any experience. So yeah. I was like, Well, give me a shot. And he's like, Nah, man, he's like, We got a full squad, like we're good. And I was like, Look, man, I was like, I'll come and wash dishes for you for free. I was like, I'll be here every day on time. I was like, I'll wash dishes, like, give me a shot to cook. Yeah. And like, teach me, like, hire me, but teach me, right? And so I fucking went every day, five days a week. You know, they would make staff meal, and I washed dishes for two months for free. Like, before he was like, all right, you know what? Starting on Monday, come through. This is the time. We'll have a knife for you. And they started, like, teaching me how to cook. Dope, man. And what was yeah. the first few things that you, like, learned that really impacted you? you like, Damn. Um, I learned how to make marinara. Um, that was one of the, one of the first things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had like some basic, just like super, super basic, like knife skills of like watching shit on TV and learning how to chop some stuff, but like how to prep stuff, you know, how to prep a bunch of veg, how to do mirepoix. Um, but one of the things I remember was making marinara because they had this giant Rondo mm -hmm. and he was like, you just got to keep stirring because like, if not, Gonna like stick. it's, it's going to stick and it's going to burn. And I remember like I, I had stirred to the back of the Rondo and this big like bubble of tomato sauce like popped up, fucking burned me on burn the you. arm. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, fuck. But I was <laughs> like, I can't burn this sauce. Exactly. And so I just like wiped it off real quick and then just like with my towel. And then I kept stirring and like two minutes later, same spot back of the sun popped ah. up same spot so i had like a burn and then a big ass burn <laughs> on the burn i don't know if i still have that fucking i don't i don't have that scar anymore but yeah man i was like yo don't let the sauce get too hot mm -hmm. don't burn the sauce don't. never <laughs> never i never thought about this till right now but i'm like man why didn't we just cook our red sauce in a bain marie it would make so much fucking sense yeah that's that's genius. It's like, like, it's like, won't charge any, like you can literally just boil it. It's yeah. fine. That's fine. It. And it won't burn. It's like you get to temperature. It's like fucking, it's like on glaze. Like, come on, man. Yeah. Be all right. Yeah. Um, That's your million dollar idea. There you go. Yeah. Right. Tomato sauce. On this is the last marine. podcast. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> Thanks for having me. This is me. it. This the last, last one. That's it. I want, I want 5%. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I have to tell my story years later be like well yeah. that was the last podcast and uh you know yeah, now i'm a millionaire yeah like thanks taco guy yeah. my son's yeah. name is precioso my yeah. my daughter's precioso yeah well, that's it Listo. i owe my life to, to <laughs> <Devin> Gonzalez. <laughs> this is my fortune <laughs> thanks fucking tomato Exa burns exactly fuck man fuck yeah so you're making marinara you're working here how long you worked there 
Uh, I worked there for about a year. Um, and then while I was going to school or while I was working there, um, I decided to enroll in community college, like into the culinary program Okay, down there. So I was like, yo, like, you know, I don't have the money to spend. I don't to spend 40, 50, $60,000 to go to like a super expensive culinary school to then come out and be making $10 an hour. Yeah. This is a, so I wish I had that mentality, bro. <laughs> My so mom was like, sign the paper. Yeah. Like, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, student debt forever. I'm still, still in the fucking dark cloud over here. Yeah. And then my mom will send me those things that say, uh, "Student loan forgiveness." <laughs> yeah. I'm like, that's just fake, bro. Yeah. They're it's never just, gonna forgive it's a scam. it. It's, it's a scam. scam. They're never yeah. gonna forgive it. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know. Too many people make money for them to ever forgive a student debt. Exactly. Like, exactly. Like I would, I would yeah. bet my life on it. Yeah. Like, that's how confident I feel about it. I mean. Uh, but yeah, so I went to community college and uh did that for a little bit and then uh i started volunteering at like different like chef events around san diego okay and so just like wanted to meet some different people and like try to get more experience and and stuff and so there was this one like cooking event that would happen with different chefs at this seafood company down there and so i met this other cat uh who you know he thought that i did a good job and he was like hey i work at this resort right and stuff uh and in mission bay and he was like you know if you want to come you know work for us we're like we need need somebody and i was like okay well you know i've been working at this catering company i'm in culinary school and uh i was like but i never worked at a restaurant and he was like yo just like come through and stuff and so i started cooking there um and they put me like on the fry station it was like this tiny tiny little like I mean, window that we cooked on. It was like me and this one other dude. There was like a reach in freezer, a fucking little baby fryer, four burners, uh, and like a little flat top. And you turned around and there was a deli station. And that was like the entire hotline Mm -hmm. uh, for the restaurant at this resort. Wow. And stuff. And so, or yeah, just for the like fancy restaurant. The Mm -hmm. resort had like three restaurants on it. Okay. And stuff. And so this, I worked with this older dude, um, and he like taught me a bunch of stuff on like how to cook and like how to work that station and stuff. And so we would like do everything together. And then, uh, you know, I would go back to school and then I, because I had been learning at, at, uh, at the restaurant, you know, I was like, I would say more advanced than not all the students, but a lot of them. Right. Cause a lot of them were like, were younger or like right out of high school and stuff. And I think at this point, I don't know how old I say this. Like I was 45 at the time. I think I was like, fuck, I don't know, like 26 or something yeah. or 25. That's still old as fuck to people getting out of high school. Yeah. You're, you you're not wrong. Yeah. You're not wrong. Were you buying the but, beer for them or what? No. <laughs> no. Hey, mister. But, hey, hey. It's like. <laughs> what are you doing after class, old man? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yo, man, like, I know I don't work at SeaWorld. Like, all y'all, but, like I'm not going to go buy all beer. Fucking but, SeaWorld. Yeah, man. But, um. Yeah, so then they told me one of the people that I was working with, like, went to go work at a different restaurant. And they were like, hey, if you want to come work full time, we'll, like, show you a lot of the shit you need to know right. if you want to do this instead of going to school. So I was just like, fuck it. So I didn't, I mean, I didn't really know better. But I, uh, yeah, I, like, dropped out of community college and then just started working there full time and then got linked up with this other chef who was my mentor. What was his name? Uh, uh, his name was uh, Chad White. And so uh, he was in San Diego. He's Chad up, White. Isn't he? He's up in Washington now. Okay. He, I think he has this company called like Spiceology, or he works. Oh no way! Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're all over the place, yeah. man. Yeah. So he's got a bunch of restaurants and stuff up there. So I like linked up with him, and I would go and help him at events while I was working at this restaurant and stuff. And um, yeah, man, just one of his idols like was a chef up in San Francisco. And stuff, and so I kept volunteering at these different events, and I ended up meeting the chef who was moving up to San Francisco to go work for this other chef right. that my mentor looked up to. So um, just kind of like on a whim, I kept bugging this, or I kept bugging this dude. I was like, "Yo, like if I come up here, like will you give me a chance to stage and stuff?" And he was like, "Yeah." And um, the girl I was with at the time was like, "Gonna move up here." to the bay with me and so finally he was like yo like i'm here now if you want to come through and come stage right and stuff and i was like fuck it so i was like i talked with my girl i was like this is what i want to do 
And she was like, yeah, like, we'll go up there. And so I fucking got the opera. I They told me I could stage, and I ended up, like, packing all my shit up from San Diego, drove a U-Haul up to the bay, was, like, crashing on a friend's couch mm-hmm, in, mm-hmm. In, uh, in Berkeley, like, Berkeley-Oakland border off of Alcatraz. And, um, you know, I ended up, like, getting the stage at this restaurant, and they were like, you know, normally, you know, we – ask people to come and stage for like two or three days but like you know you did a great job and stuff and like they gave me the job right and shit it was at this michelin restaurant in san francisco it's a cult and uh, it was, uh michael mina michael mina yeah okay so it was next to perbeco when he on california huh, when or you, on california when you worked there how many restaurants did he have in sf uh he had a couple he had like bourbon steak rn74 uh and then michael mina so they used to be at aqua and then or he used to be at aqua and uh, or at the hotel, I guess, and they moved over. So I was there in their brand new kitchen. Got you. Is where I, Did you get uh, to work with Mina? No, he was only there like once a month. Like Chris Lahamadou was yeah. the, was the executive, like corporate chef, right? And stuff. By that time, he was like big time. Yeah. And so he would be like in Vegas, and he had like hella spots. So I would right. only see him like once or twice a month, and like I don't think. I ever said anything to him or he ever said anything to me. <laughs> Michael Mina, if you're out there, this guy built your fucking empire, right? H- hardly. <laughs> <laughs> Dope. Yeah. So how long did you stay there? Uh, I stayed there for like six months. Um, six months? What yeah. happened, Chef? I mean, just a combination of things. Like uh, the girl that I was with, uh, she got cold feet. She didn't end up moving up here. Mm. And then, like, I took the, the bike shuttle uh, from MacArthur Bart over there because we worked lunch service. And uh, it was like the, I mean, to this day, probably like the worst job I ever had. Really? Like, or at least cooking. Yeah. Like no one helped anybody, uh, you know. Very cutthroat. It was throat. like hella cutthroat and shit. And I was just like, People just trying to is... get to meet Michael Mina by. Well, I mean, like I worked, the day, people I worked the day shift with one other guy and we'd have like 30, 40, 50, you know, covers on the books. It would be three and five course like tasting menus for like all these accountants and lawyers and shit. And, like, the fools who worked at night would, like, steal, like, our mise en place from the day, like, for their stations. Because, like, me and this one cat, like, we worked these two stations. But then at night, they had, like, six different stations. And, like, each station had, like, two or three people per station. Right. And so we would come in hella early, like, prep out hella shit. Or even at the end of the shift, just prep out a bunch of shit and, like, try to hide it in one of, like, three walk-ins. And it was, like, Russian roulette. Like, every day, we just had no idea. You said no idea if you would have your mise en place or not? No. It's fucking horrible. Yeah. Did they, were they doing that shit on purpose or just because they needed it for their service? I think just they needed it for their service. Right, right, right. You know, sometimes they would, like, write you a list or send you a text because they would be like, hey, we sold out of these things. Or, you know, they had, like, lobster corn dogs and, you know. Lobster just, corn dogs? Yeah. They would take, like, lobster meat and, like, shrimp and make a farce. And then, like, it was for the bar menu. And they right, had, right, like, right. duck duck tacos and just like they had like a pb and j but it was like foie with like pistachio classic that's yeah. a classic right yeah. there yeah and then the like you know the the tuna tartare was like their signature dish yeah and stuff and raw so like, egg yolk in the middle yeah quail eggs so i had to get the like little fucking scissors the topper the, the topper <laughs> Yo. yeah and like have to sort through like yeah. 30 40 50 fucking quail eggs and yeah like do a like, brunoise like a fucking pint of like habaneros and fresnos oh, every fucking day yeah it was it was a lot it was horrible yeah I remember working at those restaurants where you would do that kind of prep and if you had like one quarter of the deli left is pitching yeah it's like yo like, that, that took me 25 exa- minutes yeah and then that's people that don't know how the prep goes will always throw away the mise en place like they have no yeah. fucking clue yeah. how long it took or whatever yeah. it is dude and I was I mean from start to finish I like barely got faster at it yeah like it would take yeah, it's hard forever bro. yeah yeah the best uh guy at brunoir that i've ever seen is coleman griffin coleman griffin to me has like top five dead or alive best brunoir i've ever seen in my life yeah and when i got to meadowood that's the first thing i noticed that they were using a mandolin to make their planks and i'm like damn no one ever showed me that it was always like cut the planks with your knife yeah then, Perfect. Yeah. It's yeah. like, that's impossible. I like, I'm sorry. Yeah. There's, pro- there's probably like maybe 200 cooks in the whole world that could do it right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. For carrots, you know, cucumbers, anything. Yeah. You mandolin it first. Yeah. Same thing with radishes. Like yeah. you don't have to cut that radish with your knife. Yeah, like, dude. Like do the little f- super fine. It took me about stuff. seven years before somebody told me that. I'm yeah. like, really? Or when they fucking like put the teeth 
in the mandolin and then like do it like that and then they just pick out the little ugly ones yeah i was like what the fuck is this life hack yeah (laughs) yeah it's uh it's crazy yeah um and then so after six months when you're gonna leave from there do you have another plan do you know where you're gonna go or you just gone no like um i dipped because um you know i would take the bike shuttle and i fucking crashed my bike uh, right there by Embarcadero in the tracks. Oh, no And so way. I fucking got a concussion. Uh, like, my this car cut me off. My wheel got caught in there. And fucking, um, what happened? Uh, I went to, like, lift my bike up. And, like, I just I fell over and I fucking hit. I had a helmet, but I hit my head. I fucking scraped up my face and my hands and shit. Like, both of my hands were all fucking bloody. And I remember, like, going to work. And uh, fucking, I was like... I thought I was going to pass out like in the middle of service. I was like prepping and shit. I I just had like one of the chefs came over to me and not like, are you okay? He was just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like I had blood on my face and all these band-aids and shit on my hands and stuff. And then like I was going, you still went to work. Yeah. I did. That's a fucking cook for you right there. I didn't know better. I was like, yo, this is the only way I have money and I don't fucking have health insurance Yeah, yeah, yeah. and shit. So then I was like fucking, uh, going down the stairs and then, back i mean i guess it's still the case but all the walk-ins are downstairs and so i was like going downstairs he, or no he sent me home and i was like because i was like yo i think i really need to go to the hospital and stuff and so i was like walking down the stairs and i like fucking fell down the stairs and like got my bike and like because i would put it in the basement got my bag and fucking like uh either took the bus or i don't know what the fuck i ended up at ucsf yeah in san francisco and they were like, yeah, you got a concussion and stuff. And so then, like, I didn't go to work the next day. And then the next day after that, like, because of the concussion, I couldn't taste food. I couldn't taste any food. I remember, like, being at work and just, like, crying, like, thinking, like, yo, if I'm making this food all fucked up, like, I'm going to lose my job and stuff. And then, um, uh, yeah, one of the chefs, like, came over and I, he was, like, tasting some of my sauces and stuff before service. And he was like... He was like, this is fucking awful. And I was like, well, I use the recipes that I have. You know, it should taste like pretty, pretty right and like pretty close. And he was like, what, like, what do you mean? Like, you can't taste this? And I was like, no, like, I can't taste anything. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? Like working here? You can't taste shit and stuff. And so they like helped me fix my sauces and stuff. And I worked through service and then fucking, uh, I was, we were hella busy. I was helping the other dude on the other, on the hotline and stuff. And I was searing off some scallops and then the chef at the time like took the scallop and he was like what uh what did he say he was like this is overcooked like what the fuck is wrong with you and i was like i was like i'm sorry chef like i'll redo it and stuff and i still had like bandages and shit all over my hand and he goes he goes you have no fucking business being here and he like took the fucking scallop and like threw it at me and stuff and he was like he was like you have no fucking business being here he was like you need to fucking try better tomorrow and i was like man i don't fucking need this I just fucking went downstairs, got my shit, and I left. Right. I was just like, dog, I'm literally, like, have a fucking concussion. I couldn't taste food for, like, three weeks. Right. I, like, really thought, like, my life was over because this is how I make money. Not one sous chef, not one person was like, hey, man, are you, like, are you seriously okay? Like the, the cat I worked with, man, I don't even remember his fucking name. This dude, this white dude, he, I think, hopefully still lives in Hawaii. But, like, he was hella nice. He would, like, help me. And stuff and I would like jump over and help him or like if we had to plate a bunch of halibut or like a bunch of a steak and stuff like we'd help each other mm-hmm. but like there was that cat and then this other sous chef I think his name is like Jason uh I, fuck I think he actually has a restaurant in San Francisco now but that guy was also hella nice to me but like damn near everybody else I worked with was like just hella fucking mean mm-hmm. and hella shit and they were just like and no one said shit they just were like Yo, get out of here. Because the other thing, too, is, like, everyone wanted to work there, right? And so, like, they – and then at night, they had, like, four or six stages, mm. you know. There just, was always somebody there to take your fucking spot. Yeah, for sure. The fear of that. God damn. Yeah, so – Because that's how it used to be. Like, I remember when, when my – when Chef Jake taught me, he was like, everyone that works with you is here to take your job. You know what I'm saying? So it was like a, okay – Everyone is my enemy. Yeah. You know what I mean? And after a while, you're like, you know, you're, you're treating people a certain way that's not, not necessarily the most correct way. Yeah. And, like, they still fucking remember that shit. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's probably like, 
cats sitting home right now that don't even cook anymore that are still remembering the shit that their fucking chef told them or some asshole cook. Yeah. You know? Um, that's yeah, just, like, it's I just the way it was. It was like normal. I don't, like, hey. I don't eat raw oysters anymore because of some shit that happened there too. Really? Yeah. Huh. It was okay. fucking wild. Yeah, we had a uh, we had a summer where it was hella busy, or the su- the a uh, summer the one summer I worked there. Yeah, we uh, I was like really bad at shucking oysters. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't grow up eating them in Texas. You know, I didn't really like eat them a lot in San Diego, and um, so like sometimes we would pre shuck oysters if we had a lot of reservations because like we would sell hella oysters right. and right. now the raw bar stuff was came off of my station. So, like, some one of the sous chefs one time was like, yo, like, why don't you just pre-shuck, you know, like a dozen, you know, or 18, just have them chilling just in case. I was like, all right, tight. So, like, one day we had, like, 65 covers on the books and stuff. And so I was, like, you know, shucking up. So I shucked up a bunch of oysters. We didn't sell a single fucking order of raw oysters. And I was like, fuck. And so I went up to the sous chef, and I was like, hey. I was like, what? I was, like, whispering. I was like, hey, what should I do with this, you know? And he was like, okay, this is what you're going to do. You're going to take all these oysters, put them in a quart container, take them downstairs for, like, the seafood prep. Because there was some dish that had a farce of, like, all this different seafood mm-hmm. in it and stuff. And so it was, like, prawns and squid and oysters and I don't know what else. And he was like, just put it in there. And then he was like, tomorrow when I go make this farce, I'll just put it all in there. Right. So I was like, all right, tight. So I, like, packed up my hotel pan of all my me's to go downstairs. And I had it just, like, chilling on top so I could – drop it off first and one of the sh- one of the chefs was like he saw this core container that like very much looked out of place right and he was like yo what he like stopped me and he's like what is this and i was like just stopped dead in my tracks and i was like fuck and he was like what is this and i was like oh it's it's like the oysters from lunch service and he was like you know why don't why are they not in their shells and i was like well I didn't know what the fuck to say. And I was like, well, honestly, I was like, I was worried that we were going to have a bunch of oysters because it was hot, you know, unusually hot for San Francisco and stuff. And, you know, people get hell oysters. And and so I fucking so I shucked them all and I wasn't about to throw this other cat under the bus. Mm-hmm. And he was like, who told you to do that? And I was like, no one. And he was like, do you like oysters? And I was like, I mean, I was like, they're all right. You know, they're not my favorite. And he was like, do you like raw oysters? And I was like, nah. I was like, I don't, you know, I just do them here because it's part of my job and stuff. He was like, here, you should have some. You should eat some. And I was like, what the fuck? In my mind, I was like, what the fuck? I was like, I was like, I'm good. He was like, no. He was like, you should eat, eat some of these oysters. And I was like, all right. And so, like, I got, I put all my shit down and he went. And I was like in the middle of everyone setting up for dinner service. And stuff, and he went and fucking got a fork, and he like made me fucking eat this damn near full quart of like raw oysters. The whole thing. I mean, damn near. Yeah. And then I like thought I was gonna fucking puke. He's like, "All right." He was like, "Don't ever do this again," and shit. And I fucking went downstairs, and I fucking threw up in the in the bathroom. Yeah. And stuff, and I was like, so "He's just making f-? fucking embarrassing you in front of everybody." In front like of everybody, that? man. Yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. in front of like fifteen or sixteen people. Yeah. I was just like, what the fuck? And so, like, now, I mean, I'll eat grilled oysters or, like, oyster po' boy or smoked oysters are fine. But, like, raw oysters, I just... You won't do it. No. Fuck that guy, whoever that was. Yeah. You know? So, douchebag. Different world. Yeah, man. Different world. Different world, But now I make sure. tacos. Yeah, so. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you got out of there, and what was your next move? Um, after that, I... Were you uh, sort of over the Michelin shit? Yeah, I was just like, yo, like, this is not... If this is the way you're going to treat me, then you can go fuck yourself. Yeah, and, like, I didn't have, like, a lot of experience in it. And right. And I was like... So, like, I was from Texas, and I uh, helped this other chef in Oakland, uh, like, open this this barbecue restaurant and stuff, and... Uh, what was a barbecue restaurant? Uh, it doesn't matter. So, um, but it's not around anymore. Mm-hmm. So, um, helped the chef with the spot, um, and then, uh, you know, do the menu and stuff, and, like... You know, it's kind of a difficult person to work for. So I bounced out of there. And then um, I went to go be the sous chef at this other restaurant in downtown okay. Oakland. Um, and this girl that I knew from riding bikes, like, connected me with these people and stuff. And so I went. And then they really liked that, 
you know, I had this like fine dining background because I was like very clean and very proper and, you know, I'd like tie all the mats together on the floor and just my station was very organized and stuff. And, <clears throat> you know, they, the people who own the spot ended up having this other chef there who they didn't like at all. Mm. Um, and they were like, yo, like, and they had just opened or reopened with this different chef. And they were like, yo, like if we, we really like how you have been doing things and the things that we've seen from you and stuff and want, you know, we want you to be the chef. And I was just like, yo, like, I don't, I was like, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. Like, what does that look like? <laughs> and, and one of the, one of the owners was like, well, you know, I've been a chef at this other restaurant in San Francisco and, you know, I still have that restaurant. Like, we'll be here to help you and coach you and mentor you. And they weren't like trying to pay me shit. But at the time I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll take it, mm -hmm. you know? And so how old are you right now? Uh, right now I was 27, 27. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I had just been cooking for like a couple years mm -hmm. and definitely not ready at all <laughs> and stuff. And I was like, okay, well I have this cat who's my boss who yeah. was like telling me he's going to help me and stuff and like take me under his wing in this like pseudo father figure kind of situation. Um, and, uh, so they fired the other chef. They made me the chef. I hired a couple other cooks and stuff and, you know, just come to find out like the people who were there before, like couldn't get credit from any vendors because they owed hella people money around town. And so we were like having to get produce from like a Cisco subsidiary. And then we were having to go to restaurant Depot like once or twice a week yeah. to go get all of our stuff. Right. Um, and then like, I didn't have a car either. Like I just rode my bike everywhere. So I'd have to like wait for the owner to wake up, meet me at work. And then like, he would be hung over most of the days. And then I would take his car or we would go together and I have to buy hella shit for the restaurant. And, um, yeah, that fool ended up, you know, I think being more of a father figure to me than I realized. Cause, uh, like my father, he had like a relationship with cocaine mm -hmm. that I didn't know about. And so all the money that we were making, he was just blowing it on blow right? and stuff. And so, uh, yeah, I had like a total breakdown, uh, like one night during service, um, because we, they would not pay for a reservation system. Right. And it was like, it wasn't fine dining, but it was like a nicer spot. Mm -hmm. Right. And there was a show at the Fox and there was a show, I think Who at the, the fuck Paramount. was doing the reservations then. Um, no one just walk in. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. And, and then there was a show at the new parish also. Right. So like everyone, the entire restaurant all sat at the same time, <laughs> like seven, between seven and seven fifteen, fucking... and everybody had to leave like to go to these yeah, shows. Ramsey kitchen nightmares. And I was shit. just like, what the fuck, you know? And, uh, I was, I think down a cook that day too. And this guy was like, yo, like you got to figure this out and whatever. And like shit was taking hella long. And like, we were just go like going, yeah, just down going down in fucking yeah. flames. Man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so he was like, you know what? Like, you're not cut out for this. Like I got this. He's like, just go home. And just my cooks were just like, what the fuck is happening? And he's just, like, yelling at me in front of everybody, like, in the middle of service. Like, we're just, like, trying to crank out all this food. And so I just had, like, a total fucking breakdown. And uh, I came back the next day. And we had this, like, long talk. And he was like, yo, like, you're, like, not really ready for this shit. And I was like, dude, we have no reservation system. Like, the whole restaurant came in at the same time. Yeah. Like, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Like, I could be the most talented chef in all the land. Yeah. Like, I can't fucking help knock out food for, I don't know, fucking 50 people or 48 people all at once. Like, we don't have the capacity for this and shit. And so he was like, yo, like, I'm going to give you a couple of weeks, you know, while you, like, learn for, like, look for something else. And I ended up getting, like, hella depressed and, um, yeah, just, like, kind of took – shit just took, like, a really bad turn. Mm -hmm. Did you – um? Do you still have a good or was your relationship still rocky with your parents? Um, like, could you like yeah. with the situation that happened, did they know what was happening with you or was it kind of like you weren't talking to them? Um, I've had like a kind of off and on relationship with my mom. Like sometimes things are really good and sometimes things are hella bad. Right. Um, and then my dad was like not in my life at all. Right. Like, I didn't see my dad for like for 10 years. I think from the time I was like eight until the time I was 18. And then I tried to reconnect with him until I was like 21. And then we had this big blow up cause he was doing hella blow on the night of my 21st birthday. Right. And so I didn't really talk to them, uh -huh. you know? And so, 
Um, Did your dad go back to Mexico or was he just like absent? Uh, my dad was actually, so my dad was born actually in California, like out, like outside of LA and stuff. Um, but he was in Texas, but we just like never really talked. Right, right, right. Shit like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was like a, a, almost like acceptable for there to be deadbeat dads within the Latino community. Yeah. Like, you know, like, and people were, were friends with these dudes, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, it doesn't matter. You don't take care of your kids. Well, I'll hang out with you. I'll yeah. be your friend. Yeah. So I didn't really have like a good relationship with either of my parents. And, you know, I was like, so you got no support systems. Do you have any siblings? Uh, I have a younger brother that like we're close now, but like at the time we really weren't. And I, mm -hmm. you know, my girlfriend at the time was like, you know, tried her best to be supportive and, you know, I had friends and stuff to lean on, but like I got hella depressed. And then this girl who I was friends with used to bartend at this restaurant and they were like looking for bartenders and stuff and she was like yo like you really got to get out of the house like you really need a job she's like my job is hiring for bartenders like we can train you and so it was like for brunch and then like one night shift mm. as like a backup kind of bartender wow and shit and so me being hella depressed i was like sure i'll go bartend yeah i just like started drinking like crazy and i ended up i got fired from that job because i was hella de too depressed to go to work one yeah. day that i was just like I just like I wasn't wasn't even hung over. I was just hella depressed and just like no call, no showed, and stuff. And my co I mean, rightfully so. My coworkers are hella fucking pissed. But yeah, like, for sure. You know, fucking ten years ago, like no one talked about mental health shit at all. No, no one, no, no. one. They were just like mental health day. You know, yeah, yeah. This guy's like, a bitch. Oh, you, you, you bartend? <laughs> yeah. Like no, just <laughs> take a shot, get your ass back out. Exactly. Here. Um and uh, yeah, man, I ended up like pretty like low point in my life. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there was this program, I think it's still around, but, uh, it's called like JFK university and they have like this counseling center kind of near by the lake. And so I got some resources from some friends and, um, you know, ended up like finding a therapist and stuff and mm -hmm. was able to like kind of talk my way off the ledge. Right. Right. So right. To speak. And, um, you know, just like super thankful for that. For sure. So. JFK, is that place still there? Uh, I don't know. It's called like JFK university and, uh, you know, they had like a counseling program and stuff. And, um, it was like all the people that are in school, but like have to get their hours and stuff right. for their program. And, uh, it was like sliding scale. And at the time I wasn't working and, um, you know, I think I had to pay like $5 a session right. or something. And just like super thankful that I was like able to, to find a therapist and stuff. Cause Good fucking friends you had, man, because like. Any other fucking, I got to say though, being in Oakland probably is a, is a reason for that. Yeah. Cause if you I were in so. Texas, they'd be like, what are you fucking kidding me? Like, yeah. They'd know? be like, what the fuck is wrong with yeah, you? Yeah. They'd, they'd probably just, like, le leave you in your house until you died. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Damn. I mean, yeah. Like I had to, I didn't have a job and my friend came and moved me, helped me move like out of my place. Like the day I had to move out, he came with a bunch of cleaning shit and a bunch of trash bags and just packed up basically like told me what to do and like packed up all my shit with me. And then we cleaned like the place together. Cause I had roommates uh, also and everybody was moving out. And then I moved all my shit into my friend's garage and he like, let me crash on his couch for free for like five or six months while I went to therapy and like, you know, try Fucking to like awesome find... friend, dude, where is this guy? He's still here. He's, we're still friends to this day. Oh, what does he do? Uh, he, I think he's a machinist now. Machinist? Yeah, but I know him from riding bikes and stuff, and he's still one of my good friends to this yeah, day. Yeah, you keep saying the riding bikes. Is there, like, yeah. a bike community out here I don't know about? Um, just I used to, like, ride just bicycles and stuff around Oakland <laughs> yeah. and stuff. I didn't have a car when I moved up here. and So, so just, after like, a while, you see the same motherfuckers at the stoplight and be like, yeah, what's up? Yeah, there's, like, you know, this shit called bike party, and there was just, like— Bike party? Yeah, so, like, once a month, they would go and, like, ride bikes around Oakland or, like, around the bay— and then there's like this community bike shop that I used to help out at uh -huh. road bikes, and, uh, just like fixies and road bikes and just like little what kind of bike you have, uh, right now I have, um, what do I have? Um, I guess it's like a hybrid. It's kind of like kind of mountain bike frame. I have a mountain bike also, but it's for sale at my friend's bike shop. Okay. On consignment. All <laughs> so, right. What's but, the, uh, what's the price? Uh, it's, uh, it's 1200 bucks. Is it a mountain bike? Like yeah, it's a four mountain. mountains. Yeah. Four mountains. Don't fucking ride on the road. Hurt. No, no. The last time I need a road I, bike. 
Uh, I mean, they got bikes. I can. Uh, the sh- their shop is called Lucky Duck right, right, right. in downtown Oakland. But okay. the last time I rode that mountain bike was last year. I fucking crashed. Uh, it was like eight hours from here. I was out with some friends, like, camping and, and shit. And uh, I crashed on my bike, bruised a bunch of my ribs, dislocated my shoulder. And I was like, yo, we're done. <laughs> like, You rode I, bikes eight hours away to, to go camp? I didn't ride. No, I put it on the back of my car. Okay, I was about drove. to say, yo, this motherfucker. Yeah. God damn. Oh, no. <laughs> I think the longest I've ever rode a bike in my life was yeah. like an hour and a half. But, uh, yeah, I just met, like, a bunch of people, like, through that community around Oakland. And uh, I'm still friends with a lot of them to this day. But oh, man. I definitely, like, I feel like I, like, will never be able to, to repay my friend. So just hella thankful for him. Free tacos for life, bro. <laughs> right. <laughs> free tacos. Yeah. yeah. You hear that? Yo, free any, tacos anytime, for life. Anytime. Yeah. Anytime. Um, cool, man. Yeah. So when you get over this thing, what's your next move? Do you even want to cook again? Do you like, what do you want to do? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. Cause you tell yourself, you're like, man, I'm never going to do this thing again. Yeah. Right. And then it I didn't know what pulls else to do you back in. Yeah, man. I don't even, I don't even remember like how, what the period was from that to going to go work, um, for these other cats. But I got connected with, uh, with a supper club in San Francisco. Um, and uh, I ended up working for them, I think, for like two years or two and a half years. Supper club. Uh, yeah, it was like a kind of like fine dining catering company and supper club. Okay. And stuff. And, uh, you know, they took me in and put up with me and How many ta- people taught there? me a bunch of shit. I mean, I guess like at the time, I guess like eight. Were they still around? Uh, yeah, they, uh, they're they called uh, Stag Dining Group. Um and uh, they opened up this spot called uh, the Surf Club mm-hmm. in San Francisco. But, uh, yeah, Jordan Grosser was an executive chef and uh, this uh, co-chef and co-owner, this guy named Ted Flurry, And uh, they used to both work at Olympic together in San Francisco. And they were just, like, you know, hella nice dudes. And they took me in. And, you know, I learned a lot from them. And, uh, you know, got back into cooking with them and – uh, just like learned some cool stuff and thought I wanted to like do more like meat and like butchery stuff. Um, so I ended up doing, uh, Oh, I know I w- actually worked at this other restaurant before that, but it was kind of a, I would say like a Chez Panisse legacy restaurant, but mm-hmm. it was kind of a shit show. Heard. Um, and, it's like uh, ex Chez Panisse employees yeah, trying to yeah, yeah, recreate yeah. Chez Panisse. No, it's <laughs> just some, some, wasn't a good fit. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I worked for Stag, and then I did a butcher apprenticeship at 4505 and, like, learned how to, like, break down pigs and, like, mm-hmm. you know, would help them for events and and stuff. And then I thought I wanted to, like, go make salami and prosciutto and stuff. And so I moved out of town. For, like, buy the Michael Ruhlman book? Um, yeah, just, like, all the books. on One-way you know, bike trip out of town. <laughs> like, yeah, fuck this. Where am I going? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, yeah, I, I moved out of state to go work for this other company for a second. And then just, like, really miss California and uh, just, like, started getting depressed and stuff again. And I was just like, yo, I got to go back. So I came back to California, and then uh, I worked for some people that I knew. Uh, I worked for a meat company, like, selling uh, meat at the farmer's markets. So I did that. And then uh, I worked for a produce company as an account manager because I had just known, like, hella people around the bay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so, what produce uh, company? For Veggie Works. Veggie Works. Yeah, RIP R. Veggie Works. Yeah, well, who uh, took them over? Greenleaf? Uh, I don't know. They just closed during the Bastards. pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe. Like in Greenleaf. Yeah. Paula Linton. Yeah. I, I still need a. I I still yeah. need confirmation. Yeah. <laughs> Paula Linton's accent. Is it fake? Yeah. Is it fake? Because yeah. motherfuckers tell me it's fake. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I don't know that woman. But, um, yeah, man, so I worked at Veggie Works for a year. And then, um, yeah, I was working there. And then I got this opportunity to go work for this other company. Um, It was, like, food-related. And I was working at this warehouse for them. And then uh, I ended up getting – they were in Oakland or Emeryville. They moved to San Francisco. Right. And I was just like, I don't want to fucking be in San Francisco. Anymore. No. And then, like, my job ended up going to, like, an overnight job. And I got laid off. And – you know, they gave me like a little severance check of like a thousand bucks or whatever. And, uh, at the time I was like hella overweight 
and you know i'd like go to the taco trucks and like get burritos and you know stuff i mean it'd be like eight nine ten one o'clock in the morning i'd get like some fucking nachos or carne asada fries Mm -hmm. or like a burrito and stuff so you're you're uh, sort of like depression was making you act in ways that I guess at that point you were like, eh, whatever. Well, I'd like go out drinking and stuff with friends. And then it's like, for me, I'm very good at taking care of myself when I'm drunk. So I like drink water and take Advil. And cause I'm like such a big baby when I'm hung over. Really? So I don't, so don't want to be hung over. Right. And what's, so I, what's the deal chef? How do you do it? Cause I, I don't drink because of that. I mean, I mean, I drink, but you know. yeah, I mean, now I drink like very little, but like at the time I would just take like three Advil drinks before some or after, after drinks, slam some water, take some ibuprofen. And then I'd like go to a taco truck and like get a burrito and stuff. And so I was like, hell overweight. So the and next morning you'd be like, <sighs> yeah, I mean, really I'd be hella re- re- like refreshed, even though I just <laughs> had like 1500 calories or 2000 <laughs> calories the night before. But then I tried to like get healthier and I started, um, I, when I'd go to the taco truck or the different taco trucks and little taco spots and stuff around town, I just started mm. getting tacos and I'd get like two tacos, three tacos and that was it. So it's like way less calories, you know, than a big ass burrito. Yeah. Right. And so then I started hitting up like all these other taco spots around town and then I started making tacos at the house and I would like have friends come over and we would make tacos and um yeah man it was it was uh you know I had a couple friends that were like yo this is hella good like you should make this and stuff and I had some uh friend at the time who was also making tacos and him and the girl I was seeing and some other friends and my brother were like hella encouraging me to like yo you should do this so I took that money and I bought a I went down to the pulga I bought a little taco cart and stuff and um, yeah, just like would go and I hit up some friends who had some bars and I would like go post up outside of their bars. Permits or anything like that? Nah, just, just prep, yeah, yeah. prep at the house. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Prep at the house, you know, Good on uh, them, man. as, as much as possible. And it's also after hours, right? So after five o'clock, no health inspectors around, yep, just yeah, hella yeah. under the radar and stuff. And you think that's changed in recent times? What's that? Like, because there's such a community of taco trucks and late night food, do you think there's health inspectors at night? Um, I mean, the way that they catch people now is on Instagram because now all the health inspectors are on there. And so, like, when I got popped, like, they had, like, a whole file on me, like, on some Fed level shit. They're like, oh, you know, you're at this spot. You got all this other shit. You know what's funny is uh, there's a guy in San Diego actually fighting against that because they're they're doing the dudes who – um who do the sheet pan cooking on the side of the thing after yeah. the stadium shit. Yeah, the hot dogs. Those, yeah, those motherfuckers are getting, like, harassed by police, and, like, they're, like, taking all these little, like, these little ladies, all their food and shit. Yeah. And this dude basically stands up for them, so he'll go on camera and be like, yo, what are you doing to these yeah. little ladies? Yeah, Damn, man, bro. I mean, we just, yeah, it's like people are just trying to make a living, man. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, I definitely understand, like, all the fucking privilege I have of, like, being born in this country and stuff but like hella people like in other countries they just like sell food on the street Mm -hmm. you know and And it's okay and it's okay Mm -hmm. it's fine you know and i think the health inspect the health inspecting system is some of the biggest bullshit i've ever like none of those fucking people have like most of them are not chefs have never worked with food to a point where it like matters to them like if i get somebody sick no one will come to my restaurant ever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they come into these fucking places, guns blazing, fucking trying to get people in trouble, closing down places. We're going to put a C on your door. It's like, what the fuck are you doing, yeah. Roy? Yeah. You know, you work on a desk. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're food. They're cops, but for Yeah, food. they're cops for, for food. But yeah. And that's exactly the, the thing that I've realized. And uh, whenever I consult for people who are having those types of issues, it's like, Treat them like cops. Yes, sir. No, sir. Like, don't give them any. Extra yeah, as long as you're submissive, yeah. they're like, oh, okay. He respects me. He yeah. respects my my license as a health inspector. Yeah, or like, no I'll one give respects. You a, I'll give you a thirty day pass to like do this one thing or whatever. Fucking bullshit, man. And so, yeah, like well, I was just doing the shit out the house, and I would just go set up, and then like people wanted us to like go start doing catering for them, and um, you know, at this point. <laughs> You know, fast forward, I was, like, able to stack some cash and uh, ended up getting, like, uh, I got a, a, I was renting out a commercial kitchen and stuff, or time at a commercial kitchen, like, one of the hourly ones. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And so I did that and people wanted us to then like cater a wedding for them. And I was like, I'm never going to cater a wedding, you know? And, and we did it or no, some friends kept asking me like, yo, will you please come cater, <laughs> cater our wedding? I was like, yo, like, I'll I'm never not, cater a wedding. I'm, a we- I'm then never we doing did that. it. And then we did it and it was fine. And I was like, oh, I can make some like good money doing yeah, this. And then some people at that wedding. And you get wanted, hammered after. W- wanted us to cater their wedding and then some friends of friends. And it just kind of grew because at first it was just like who was helping up. I mean, just like random friends, like I'd hit up somebody or be like, hey, can you take orders or take money? And like I'd make the food and stuff. And, um, you know, just kind of like one thing led to another. But like I had no expectations when I started this. Like the name of this is Tacos del Precioso. Like I wanted a, a name that was different. And even though at the time when I started, I was like, I mean, no joke, like probably 50 pounds lighter. I would joke with other Mexicans. I was like, well, Tacos del Gordo was already taken. So yeah, like, yeah. I needed something. The hey, joke yeah. works better now. Yeah. But, uh, you know, <laughs> but then, like, white people couldn't say precioso. And, I mean, they fucked yeah, it up. Tell me about time. it with the sucio shit. Yeah. They're they're like, like what, w- w- what's your podcast yeah, called? Su- Suslo. I'm like, yeah, it means dirty. And dirty. they're like, dirty talk. They're like, wait, where are we going? They're like, yeah, you're a chef? Dirty? Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah it's they don't j- understand. It's a joke. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I had no expectations of, like, when I started this. And, like, you know, we have, like, just grown. And, like, through the pandemic, we were able to do a bunch of community meals with World Central Kitchen and, like, Mandela Partners. It's, like, a local organization here in Oakland. Mm-hmm. Like, big shout-out to Mandela Partners. They do so much for the fucking community on the real. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, man, so we were able to make it through the pandemic and stuff. And, you know, we just, like, grew our staff. You know, I have a business partner, like, helped me, like, over the last three years, like, also grow the business and stuff and you know so like people i think a lot of people think that we like we're just doing pop-ups but like most of our business was catering we have a van go set up set up the taco carts like do birthdays quinceaneras weddings you know corporate catering all kinds of shit and stuff what what would you say separates your tacos from the rest man um I mean, I think, like, we have – it's two things. Like, most of the ingredients that we use, like, we source them from local farmer's markets. So, like, when I used to work for this meat company, I met a bunch of farmers and purveyors, and so I still have relationships with them to this day now. I mean, fuck, like, eight years later. Um, And uh, so, you know, every Tuesday I go to the – uh, to the South Berkeley farmer's market. And then Thursday mornings I go to the San Rafael farmer's market. Cause like I used to work at that market. And so I still know hella farmers there. Um, and I think like the, the produce is like top notch. And so I do that. And then, uh, more than half of what we do is also plant-based. And so we don't use like any soy or any fake meat, but mm-hmm. like it's all, you know, we do like a cauliflower al pastor. We do like a charred camote taco, which is inspired from like, uh, Chef Gabriela uh, from Cala in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. You know, we do like a salsa matcha on there. Um, you know, we do like uh, mushroom mole, like just all kinds of stuff. And we, you know, we do a lot of meat. We source like really great, mm-hmm. great products and stuff. But I would say the things that separate us is like our sourcing. And then, you know, we do a lot of plant based stuff as well. Because right, I want right. our food to be, I want everybody to be able to, to eat our food. Right. Is it um, is it just uh, tacos? Or are you doing burritos? Uh, I don't do burritos. Okay, okay. Yeah, just had to ask because yeah, you no, were eating no. them. Yeah, no, for sure. That. <laughs> Man, <laughs> eating burritos like that was my job. Yeah, because like uh, when I worked for Jake Rojas, he was like, at first he was like, we're not doing fucking burritos, and he was like, we gotta do burritos. <laughs> <laughs> we were in fucking Rhode Island, so yeah. what are you gonna do? Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> like the planchas that we that we have, you know it would just be hella hard to do burritos and like there's so many people that do burritos really well Mm -hmm. you know and then like if my food costs are hella high like you know i don't think people are gonna buy a fucking 20 dollar 25 dollar burrito right you know and i'm not putting like filet mignon and like lobster in it or something or you know just some uni or something crazy Mm -hmm. so so when did you from the inception to like doing all the catering and everything when did you know that you were like i got something this is something. I mean, shit. I mean, probably like within the first. So we started in July, uh, whatever five years ago was. Um, we did a party at Eli's Mile High Club, um, and I knew them from when I used to sell produce and stuff. And uh, you know, we did 
it was like the after party for this thing um, called Burger Boogaloo. It was like this music festival right. in Mosswood Park. Yeah. And so did that, and we're just like hella busy, and people like really love the food. And we did like rajas with, with cheese. Uh, we did uh, al pastor, and um, I think I did like a chicken mole or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but people were like, yo, like this is hella good. Like, you know, it was really good. And then fast forward – you know, we would do some other spots and then fast forward to April of the next year. Um, uh, we started doing a pop up there, um, on Tuesday nights and like a homie at the time would come and DJ and then, uh, people would come and eat our food. And like, that was the slowest night of the week at that bar. Mm. And then we like blew it up. It was like hella busy. We'd have a line of like 10, 12, 15, 20 people, mm -hmm. like the whole night, like every Tuesday night. And stuff, and so Damn. really within the first year, I was like, "Yo, like, we were people, popping." People are like into this, yeah. And so, just super thankful to everybody that came through, and for sure, um, you know, even now, like right now, we're booking weddings and stuff mm -hmm. out to next year. And now, how'd you just, get into Odin? Um, so I got into Odin because um, a few years ago, before the pandemic, there were some big earthquakes that hit in Mexico. So they hit in Mexico City right. and Oaxaca and stuff, mm -hmm. and. Um, I hit up like literally everybody I had ever fucking met for a favor, you know, to, and we threw this big fundraiser actually at Eli's and we, you know, I got gift certificates, cookbooks, haircuts, tattoo appointments, like a bunch of liquor and beer reps that I knew, like gave us like big gift pack back it, uh, packages and shit like that. And so one of the people that I hit up was Silvia and Corey from, or from Nido yeah. at the time. And um, they were like, yeah, you know, absolutely. And they were, like, super nice and hella generous and stuff. And so that's how I first met them. And, um, you know, so we did this fundraiser and stuff, and it was cool. And, like, I, you know, would see them around town, and sometimes I would go to Needle for brunch and stuff. They had, like, really bomb cocktails. And um, fucking uh, then during the pandemic, I started another business. It was, like, a, like, plant-based panaderia. So we're doing, like, conchas and you know like little puerquitos and all that stuff but it was all vegan mm -hmm. um because like we felt that there was a need for doing this and so my friends uh like sibling would bake goods and we would sell them for our meal kits for the taco business like during the pandemic and it really took off and week after week after week like people were buying more stuff and uh, one of the employees that worked at needles backyard I think told them like, yo, you need to try this pan dulce mm -hmm. and stuff. And we like talked, we met them again and talked with them and they had this other bar area. And so they let us go and sell pan dulce there for free on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, uh, we just like weren't making enough money and we ended up shutting it down. But I saw that at Nido, they were like cleaning it up and like giving it a facelift and stuff. And they, uh, you know, we ended up talking about it. And they were like, yo, like, do you want to come do the food here and stuff? And they were like, we want to do the bar program and we want you and your team to come do the food yeah, and stuff. And who was your team at the time? Um, I had uh, my business partner and I had a couple cooks at the time. Um, I think at the time there was, I think, five or six of us. Mm -hmm. Were you still yeah. renting space in the kitchen to cook? Uh, yeah, we were renting space at, at another. We were sharing um, a commercial kitchen with another catering company. Okay. So we were renting space from them. Okay. And, um, you know, it just, at the time it just like kind of didn't make sense and some more time kind of dragged on. And then we like revisited that conversation and stuff. And originally we were going to do like this bigger, like dinner menu and have like big plates and all this stuff. And then they came back and they're like, Hey, like we really just want some like really solid food here and, you know, some bar bites and some tacos and stuff mm -hmm. to like really goes well with the mezcal program that we're trying to do got you and so you know it just like made sense for us for the business and um yeah we moved in there a few months ago um and then we just opened at the end of may and stuff so we've been open about two months now yeah yeah how's it feel man dude it's been wild yeah. uh it's been wild i've been learning a lot and you know just thankful for everybody that's been like supportive both on my staff and from their staff and, um, you know, just the community and our customers that have been coming through, like their old regulars, like a lot of our regulars. Um, 
and uh yeah it's been pretty well received and just super thankful for that cool yeah where does it where does it go from here will you open more spaces will you just keep doing the catering thing do you want to expand further than the bay area um yeah i think for us we actually just had a meeting today like we want to open another day because right now we're just open three days a week Mm -hmm. we're open thursday friday saturdays um, because we have so much catering and just wanted to like get a good like track record uh not only in sales but just like get comfortable with the space and as yeah. we're getting to know it uh so we're hoping to open a fourth day in the next couple of weeks Got you. and stuff and like the catering for us has not stopped at all so Dude, that slow growth is what you need man yeah i find that most of the time the restaurants that are open seven days uh where it makes sense uh from a um <clears throat> a business standpoint to be yeah. open seven days but it really doesn't make sense for staffing it's so hard. It you doesn't, have to have two sets of yeah, staff. Yeah, you got to have two sets of staff. It doesn't make sense for, for a lot of things for small businesses trying to grow. Yeah. So it's like one day at a time is perfect. Yeah. And um, I always thought about this because I, I don't want to be fucking cooking seven days a week, but I would love to do a dinner service three days a week. And I was talking to somebody recently where I was like, let's just have a space where you cook three days a week. One day is like whatever, not, you know, closed. And yeah. then I'll cook the rest of the three days. Yeah. And we, you know what I mean? And it's like, I feel like there can be those, uh, uh, joint hybrid restaurants. Yeah. And people will understand it. Yeah. Like, Oh, cause if you're open seven days and this, I thought about a, a charter Oak, like there's only, you know, people are, then there's people that come there fucking five days a week. Yeah. But for the most part, if I'm at home and I'm like, Oh man, like I really want a burger. Um, I'll get one tomorrow. They're open tomorrow. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's like Slug Bar or somewhere that like you. It's like, oh, I better fucking go get those tacos right now. Yeah. Because they'll be closed for fucking two days and I won't be get be able to get them. Yeah. You know. So it's like uh, you're keeping things scarce and that makes more value out of the thing. You know, it probably helps you sell events too. Yeah, I mean, for us on the event side, like we're booked out for like the next two months. We just. Uh, started booking holiday parties and stuff and like we yeah. already have several weddings on the books for next year and so you know what we try to do too is like if we're booked out like I try to pass that business along to my friends who have other taco businesses or other food businesses because like you know if people are already coming to us like I'm hoping that they're going to trust our recommendation and be like hey go hit up these people mm-hmm. like you know go go see what's up with them and but yeah I think like having the slow growth, I'm very thankful for that because now I don't have the expectation. Like I have to be open, you know, five days a week or six days a exactly. week and then also have a catering company and also be able to turn out all these events and mm-hmm, then, mm-hmm. you know, lavar todas las vasicas and take everything back to storage. And yeah, you know, you know, that's a, shit. that's a, that's a, a telltale sign of a true worker that opened a business. Cause you know what it's like to be the worker. Yeah. But it's these fucking investors out here just fucking being like, oh, open seven days a week because it makes sense on paper. Yeah. And then all your fucking people are suffering. and like, Or you don't even have people. Or you don't have people, yeah. yeah. And then it's like when you're the CDC or chef of those kinds of places, when you don't have nobody, who is it? You. Yeah. It's you. And they don't pay you anymore for that because they no. paid you your salary. Yeah. You know, and in California, there's this, like, enticing thing that happens sometimes where they're like, oh, we're going to pay you 120 In California, that means 60 yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, so it's like, expensive yeah, to live here, man. It's expensive to live here. So yeah. take your salary, cut it in half. That's what you actually make. Yeah. And that for the longest time, like I don't know what mentality I was in, but I didn't real I didn't realize it, you know? And when you get offered the shiny six figure salary, you're like, Yeah, fuck yeah, I'll take it. But at the end of the day, it's like more taxes. Like yeah, exactly. you're, still, you're still like making the same shit you made before, you know? It's kinda bullshit. Yeah, you're in a higher tax bracket. I mean yeah. I've never to this day cooking have made six figures Mm -hmm. but like yeah man it's wild it's not worth it dog and everything just costs so much money yeah honestly it's it's worth it to do it the way you're doing it to like when if i compare it to music you own your masters yeah you own your recipes you have your cooks you have your business model you know what you're doing and when you have that like and that that's why you have forward mobility yeah because you know what the fuck you're doing and you took your time to like learn it yeah versus this is the goal. Let's start there. Let's then let's achieve it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm sure after this long of cooking those same dishes, like they're probably fucking fire. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? To this day where you're like, I don't even think we can make this any better than we make it, you know? And man, I'm, I'm fucking, I'm proud of you, bro. Like it's Thanks, a, man. takes a long time to get here <laughs> and people don't know the hard work that goes into fucking running a restaurant. Dude, it's been crazy. Like the things that, you know, I thought, I thought that like the challenges I was going to have in us opening you know, let's say that they were over here or like one through five. Like these are the, some areas that are going to be hard, man. None of those things that I thought were going to be hard have been hard. All the shit that's been hella hard are all these other things that I never saw come in mm -hmm. at all. And it was fucking a grind. What are, what are some of those things? Just like s staffing emergencies and different shit. I mean, I think that I was naive to think that I was immune to, staffing challenges because like one of the things that we do is like we make sure that we pay our people really well right like from dishwashers cooks prep cooks everybody because like i i mean i've been there like people aren't trying to pay people and stuff and if i can pay people more or like make my life a little fucking easier and i pull in a little less money like fine you know yeah. it's like i sleep better at night that's knowing, be that's yeah. way better yeah, That's you know, and even if I'm making less money or even if I need to like struggle a little bit for a minute yeah. or whatever, like, yo, money's coming. We have events down the road. That's what a business owner does. Yeah. He and sacrifices so his fucking workers can have what they need. Yeah, man. You and know? it's uh, it's just been wild. And so it, it was definitely been a learning curve and, um, you know, thankful for my team and thankful for the team at the restaurant that have like been there and been flexible and like we're trying to you know figure all this stuff out and you know ultimately like we want to have a good service experience and mm -hmm. have a good food experience and stuff and we're like i think everybody that works for us like wants that too and they like care and they try and i'm just you know there's definitely like those people that are like oh i did this all by myself or like i'm self-made i'm like well i don't think that that is actually true but like no. so many people you just have like, fucked over all the people that that helped you make it exactly now then, you can't now you can't turn around and be like oh that guy helped me yeah yeah and so and that's i'm I, hella thankful yeah we were talking about this before that's the issue that we're in now yeah no one gave anyone credit for 10 years yeah and then all the fucking people that didn't get credit are pissed off yeah and they're fucking personal chefs now yeah so it's Making like hella money yeah you make hella money but yeah. let me tell you man it's not all it's cracked up to be no, because, like, I mean, all yeah. the dietary restrictions, or yeah. the, you know, whatever the things are yeah. or, or the type of clients mm -hmm. that can afford to yeah. pay you that salary, you're also like, they own you. Yeah, you're a servant. Yeah, for sure. You're a servant. Yeah, yeah. And you're that, paid well. Yeah. But they own your ass. And that type of, of mentality, too, it's like I'm trying to, um, because that's the job I need. Why? Because this is the goal. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It's like the goal isn't to be fucking in the kitchen being on a station. The goal is to be chef of the world. How are you chef of the world? You have this, yeah. you know what I mean? And to do this, I need a job that pays that much, right? So you look for personal jobs in the space. And from what I found, if you are like direct and tell them what you want and they really want you, they will give you those things. Yeah. But if you are meek and treat them like your chef, they will take advantage of you. You know what I'm saying? Just like any any chef does. Yeah. I just recently spoke with somebody who's good friends with uh, Skeens. And from my understanding, no one is good friends with Skeens. Right? So, but, but I think that there's two sides to every coin, right? Yeah. There's people that love you and there's people that hate you. Yeah. And will always be, no yeah. matter what. I feel right? like that's true of me, the, of, of yeah, everyone. Of everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't mean we need to fucking cancel them. Yeah. Like, no. Come on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But um, when he was like, oh, he's my good friend, like that opened my perspective to being like, we can't cancel fine dining necessarily. We don't need to. We shouldn't. No. Because it's a it's like a, a goal. It's like the people that come to work for you, like some of them have an aspiration to be like a fine dining chef. Yeah. And I think that we are we would make mistakes if we're like, oh, you don't want to do that. You don't want to. You know what I mean? Let's just find good bosses in that you know good leaders in that section yeah and then i think we can make fine dining what it what it used to be what, like what it meant yeah. without the fucking like mental torture that you go through yeah you know um but yeah it's like we make tacos like i make tacos for a living yeah like that is my job yeah. and also we make i think we make really good food i try to fuck yeah I'd go out of my way to like be you know the best version of myself and not on some like 
high horse, I'm better than everyone's shit, but just like I've had so many fucking bad bosses and I don't know everything, but like I try, I try my best. I try to be really good people like to my team and shit. And like, you know, it just, it's so wild too. Cause like, even at the farmer's market, it's like, I see some of these chefs and like, I don't necessarily know who they are, or maybe I've heard of their restaurants and you know, I see them every fucking week at the Thursday, especially at the Thursday San Rafael market. Marin? Yeah. in Marin and stuff and like you going tomorrow uh yeah i'm going i'll see you all right uh i'm going at nine so i'll be up there at nine thirty. all right yeah. i try to get there at seven. Oh yeah i used to do that well i harass i harass the the fucking uh the farmers there yeah like start talking to them about yeah. shit and i'm like well they're trying they're, to set up yeah and they're like like please leave us alone and i'm like <laughs> whatever bro yeah you know what i mean no i used to get up at six to go there early but now I wait till traffic dies down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the better idea, chef. Because I got to, you know, I got to work nothing. service now. I wanted, but, I wanted to have a fucking Susio talk table there. That'd be hilarious. And do Susio talks like in the morning, even if it's just me. Yeah. But like honestly, any chef that comes by, yo, come in the booth, come in the booth. Yeah, we'll we'll gra- just fucking we'll grab talk. a coffee. Yeah, go grab a coffee. Let's talk some shit, dude. Hella people go up there. Right. It's like lately, I've been having some of these chefs ask me like, "Hey, like, where are you from?" Like, or whatever. And I was like, oh, I got a catering business in Oakland. Or, you know, we do food at this. They, start, they start noticing. Yeah, yeah. Like, tattoos. Well, or, like, I just have the fucking chef cart, right? Yeah, just loaded. Yeah. I got, like, mushrooms and chiles and cabbage and corn and all this shit. Yeah. And so, like, sometimes, like, I'll rock my taco gear and sometimes I don't. Um, and they'll just ask me, right, like, hey, like, where are you from? And I was like, oh, we got this business in Oakland. Or they're like, oh, man, you come all the way from Oakland. I'm like, yeah. You know, and they're like, why? I'm like, oh, you know, I used to work at this market and I know these farmers and stuff. And they're like, all right, tight. You know, and they're like, oh, well, like, what do you do? And I was like, oh, like, you know, we make tacos. And like, oh, OK. You know, and you can see the look on their face like they're like, oh, you come up here to to buy stuff to make tacos. OK. All right. And you can see the wheels turning and they're like, oh, well, what's the business? I'm like, oh, it's it's called Tacos de Precioso or Tacos de Precioso. And they're like. You can just see them like try to mouth the name, mm-hmm. you know, like tacos. They're like, what? They're like, oh, okay. And then they're just at that point, they just like lose interest. They're like, oh, okay, cool. Well, good to see you around. And then that's it, you know. And it's just like, it's just like this racist ass shit where like, yo, like, why can't this food be good? You know, like it's the food that they fucking eat. Yeah, you, you know? know, or even probably worse, you know. I I think <laughs> when you come from a Michelin background, I think when you're in Michelin, just like I was telling you before, you have to have opinions. Yeah. If you do not have opinions, then you are looked at as like a an indecisive kind of and eh, whatever. He he likes everything. Who's gonna yeah? Who's gonna trust his word? They like opinions. They like people who are like this is like this. You know. Yeah. Um, because people respond well to authority, and I get that. Yeah. You know. But to to, I mean, but alienate not- other chefs, alienate other business owners that have cooks that people rely on them that make food. That's fucking horseshit. Well, I mean, they're not. They're probably not used to a brown dude at the farmers market as a shopper buying stuff to then make tacos. Mm-hmm. You know, because they're like, oh, I use the same ingredient, but I charge eight times more what you charge for the dish or the 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 menu or the fucking. Tasting. I've had people that are my friends tell me, yo, this is too nice to be a taco. And you like take the tortilla away and now it's this nice composed dish. When we were doing this pop up a couple years ago in the fall, we would take delicata squash. We would cut it hella thin and char it. I would take a bunch of fennel, caramelize the fennel, and then I would make a habanero persimmon hot sauce and put that on top of the squash with like some candied pumpkin seeds or like candied pepitas. And my friend was like, yo, this is way too nice for this. And I was like, why? Like, why? Just because we put a tortilla on this, now all of a sudden it loses the value. And you call it a taco, now it's lost its value. Mm -hmm. It's like, yo, man, we're buying from the same fucking vendors. Hell, I mean, I mean, fuck, like some of the best chefs in San Francisco and in, you know, Marin, the North Bay, Napa, whatever, shop at that fucking market. And I see yeah, they them do. every fucking week. Three Michelin star market right there. Yeah, I see them. I fucking see them. Mm-hmm. But it's like, yo, I'm buying the same thing. You know, but like people are not going to give, you know, traditionally 
tacos de precioso, they're not going to give us, you know, a hundred, 150, $200, you know, for a dinner per person anyway. And it's like, we're also not doing, you know, a 10 course tasting menu. Like we're making tacos. Like at our spot, we have some, uh, uh, some salads, we have some ceviches, we have tacos, we have like, uh, you know, my homie's been helping us out from Fish and Bones named Bully. Like there, we have like a, a cheese plate and like a Mexican like charcuterie board and stuff that they put together for us. Um, and it's just like this idea, you know, if it's Mexican food or a taco or fucking, uh, you know, like Korean food or Chinese food, it's supposed to be cheap. But all of a sudden it's like Japanese food or Italian food. It's just like, watch out. It's got to be so fucking expensive. Yeah. You know? And, like, I see it in these fucking chefs' faces. Like, when they ask me, like, I don't even really engage with them. I, I say what's up to my friends that I see up there and we chop it up or we get a coffee or whatever. But, like, for the most of these people that I don't know or when they approach me and I'm buying from Toscano Farms or I'm buying from Full Belly or I'm buying, you know, from River Dog or Tomatero or Ortiz or Rojas or all these other fucking farms that I buy from every week, they start to ask me. And as soon as I tell them that I fucking make tacos, you can see like their facial expression drop. And then I tell them that, oh yeah, it's, you know, tacos de precioso. And they're like, oh, all right, well, cool, man. Well, good to see you around. They never fucking say hi to me after that again happens all the time it's been happening more and more lately and stuff because like there's a first wave of chefs that get there at 7 30 because the market opens at eight o'clock and so you gotta you know trying to battle and jockey for a fucking chef cart and then there's the second wave that i go to now that like you know we show up at like 9 30 9 45 and try to jockey for carts to get all of our shit and it's like yo all of a sudden you put this fucking flour tortilla or the corn tortilla like around some food and it's like now lost its value and it's just like it's so like rooted in just fucking racism and oppression. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, now I'm not worth now I'm not worth it or now my employees are not worth it mm -hmm. or, you know, this food is not worth it. Like I could take the same fucking food, put it on a fucking plate and put some microgreens or some little edible flowers. And like now all of a sudden, like I could fucking charge like forty dollars for this fucking plate. Yeah. You know, and that's wild. Yeah, man. And like, I'm not trying to fucking change the world and like redefine what Mexican food is or whatever. But like, you know, people ask me like what my food is and I tell them we're, you know, California seasonal Mexican food. You know, like we don't use tomates like in the winter. We don't use chiles and we use dry chiles in the winter. We make everything from scratch, you know, um, with the exception of like the tortillas and stuff. Right. But are you going to get into that game? I mean, I've thought about it. I got, like, my my homie, uh, his name is Michael De La Torre. Mm -hmm. He owns OK Chulo. Right. Um, and so one of the dishes on the menu are some beef tacos. And so we confit this, uh, it's lengua and brisket in tallow. And then I take all that, the leftover tallow, and I give it to him. And he makes me flour tortillas f specifically for those tacos. Really? Yeah. So mm. his his tortillas are, like, banging, but... You know, one day maybe we'll make our own, but, you know, it's... Um, slow growth, baby. Yeah, slow growth. Get there. Yeah. yeah. I got I to gotta learn how to walk before I can run. Exactly. And I'm, you know, we're still crawling. You know, next, maybe <laughs> next time I'll talk to you, you'll be selling those tortillas in the fucking farmer's market. Something, man. And those... Yeah, it's, no? uh, it's been wild, man. But I love what I do. Like, I love my food. I'm just... And I'm, like... I love to go and engage with people. And I think like, that's why I've been successful even from like learning how to make friends when I was in school, you know, like, or having to make new friends every fucking time of like, I can go and interact and like go talk to restaurants and go like try to get those accounts to sell produce. Mm -hmm. Or like I could be set up in front of your bar, just like, you know, slanging tacos and stuff. Cause I just engage with people, mm -hmm. you know? And like, if we would be set up and people don't have money or, you know, you definitely look like they're down on their luck. You just ask them like, Hey, do you guys, do you need some food? You know, like when I first got started, I would sell breakfast tacos. Cause again, <clears throat> Texas, um, you know, I would sell breakfast tacos. What's that fucking uh, plate? Taco Cabana. Yeah, dude. Taco Cabana. <laughs> dude, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. God damn. At two in the morning. Yeah. bro. Take my money. <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, like I used to sell breakfast tacos, uh, in front of bicycle coffee uh -huh. down in Jack London. And, uh, you know, there's like a, like a center, like a home, a couple blocks away. And 
there was one time where this dude like came through and it was just like hella aggro and like started yelling at one of the owner's mom who was there and, and stuff. And I just went up to him. And I was like, Hey man, like, have you, have you had anything to eat today? He's like, what, what? I was like, yeah, man, you, do you need some food? He's like, what, what do I need some food? He's like, well, I, I, mean, I don't have any money. I was like, all right. I didn't, I didn't ask you if you had money, man. I was like, I'm selling some tacos here. Like, can I get you some tacos or like, can I buy you a coffee? Like, you need something? He was like, yeah. Yeah, man. Like, I could, I could use something to eat. I was like, all right, cool. And so, like, I gave him some tacos and, I, like, chilled the fuck out. Yeah. And maybe he was just fucking hungry. And I just told him, I was like, yo, if you ever see me here, because I would, they used to, uh, I would be there on Friday mornings. Yeah. And I was like, if you ever need food and you see me here, I got you. And it's just like, we have, just like, this shit is just so hard, man. And, like so many people are down on their luck. And even after the pandemic, like I also thought that I was fucking naive that I thought that this industry would just be better. And I just feel like it's worse. Mm -hmm. You know, it's gotten worse. We've like, as an industry, like learned how to fucking exploit people. And it's like, sometimes people just like need a fucking meal and to not fucking be judged, man. Yeah. And like, that's the best part about being Latino. Yeah. Or brown, black, for that nature. It's like we're just always trying to feed people. Yeah, and but you, <laughs> but, you but you can, <laughs> you can survive. You know, you can survive in a crack house, and you can survive in the White House. Yeah, no fucking problem. Yeah, like give me whoever, <laughs> we'll have a party. Don't worry, we'll have a good time. Yeah, everybody's gonna feel good. Yeah, no matter of state, where you're at, whatever. Yeah, you know, and that's something that I, I think is important because, um. No matter what, whenever you're around some white people, because that's another thing. Like, we can't go all the way like they did and say all white people are like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, that's fucking racist, right? Yeah. And it's like, if we overcorrect to that much, I, I actually had this thought the other day. I was like, what does this world look like 500 years from now? Because the way it's going, it seems like white people are going to be fucking slaves in 500 years. You know what I mean? I mean, like, that's even that's <laughs> even if we still have like air to breathe. Damn and, like, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Water. Exactly. Like, exactly. Can we get to fifty. I'm saying years? if everything was perfect. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the way that the narrative is going, like that's where we're going. Yeah. And we're just gonna like become them after a while. So it's like let's slow it down. Let's understand that uh, no one knows any better, even though it seems very obvious that people should know better. Yeah. They don't know any better. Man, people have lost their goddamn minds. Yeah. Man. Just for the way sure. people like drive over the for past couple sure, years. Dude. And like, I feel like hella old person like saying this shit, but it's just like <laughs> damn near every day. I almost get in a car accident. Yeah. Like the other day by the lake, I was in the far right hand lane to get on the freeway. The light was green. I was going and this car one lane over from me starts coming over into my lane. I had to slam on the fucking brakes yeah. from the far right lane. They're making a left-hand turn. They're going over one, two, three, four, <laughs> four lanes of traffic to fucking make a left yeah. to go by, you know, Trader Joe's and T-Mobile and shit. I'm just like, dog, just go up and turn around. Yeah, I, It's just become that phone. Yeah. Oh, wait, I can't press a button and do it? I got to go right now. Meltdown. Dude, you know? it's wild. Yeah, and I think it, it's like... Uh, I call it slave mentality. Like it's not necessarily like slavery as we knew it, but it's a different type. It's a, it's like a controlling thing. Yeah. Like, yeah, go on your phone. Look at fucking TikTok for three hours. And then when you fucking look up, you're like, what well, happened? It's nighttime. Exactly. I didn't have dinner. Exactly. Like, what happened? Or if for my generation, it was video games. Yeah. Yeah. Play the fucking video games. Stay, stay there. Yeah. You know? I never played video. I mean, we had them, but my brother was always better. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. always beat me. He just and watched. So I, yeah. And so I never wanted to play. I yeah, would go yeah, yeah. outside. But even now, like, you know, I'm thankful that, like, I have someone who's coming on board on my team, like, starting next month. They're going to take over our social media so that I'm just going to delete Instagram off my phone because I'm guilty of it. Do it, bro. I fucking, I'm always on that shit. Mm -hmm. And I, that's not how I want to spend like my time. it's mindless. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I think gain anything from it. I've switched my habits to being like, if you're not creating something, then get off. Yeah. And that's honestly what's helped me with TikTok. Cause I don't like looking at TikTok. It's too much stuff for me at once. I don't have it because I yeah. don't trust myself. Exactly. Like, I have to work yeah. and I want I, my, the relationships in my life are important. Exactly. And it's like, I spend too much time on Instagram as it is. 
if I had TikTok, dog, I would never, I probably wouldn't even be able to pay yeah. my bills or my girl would kick me out of the it's house. It's kind of crazy. I mean, yeah. when you're trying to build something like this, it's like you need to do it. Yeah. You know, and like the narrative is three TikToks a day, three this a day. It's like, bro, yeah. that takes time. So and it's much like, time. For, and you I have know, ADHD. It's like, exactly. The focus and attention. <laughs> I'm just like, yo, Dude, man, I got to yeah. put out 17 fires every day. Like, and that's, but that's right there, like the 17 fires and the cooking and the, and the like, that's what keeps you focused as an ADHD person. Yeah. Like I'm the same and do trying to do this digital shit where you're like, uh, there's no deadlines. There's no service. Like yeah. if I, if I don't get these reels done by a certain time, there's no like repercussions. Yeah. You, you know I, mean? A, I mean, you asked me, you know, you gave me like three or four times to be on here. You're like, yo, I'm free this day here. Or I could have come earlier at six or right now. I'm like, well, this works for me. You're like tight. This works for me. And then, I came, you know, yeah. I came through. Yeah. It's not like, oh, you know, Sucio Talk's got to open every day at four o'clock. Exactly. You fucking pick those herbs yeah. right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have five minutes. That's what, I, that's what I'm grateful for. five minutes to set for. up this, these lights. You know, and Let's honestly, go. the vision that I had a couple of days ago was I think, you know, I need a food hall. Yeah. I want a food hall. I want to open one in Oakland. I want, um, uh, you know, to give opportunities to young cooks, young people who who maybe don't know how to open a business. Let's yeah. be sure when you're learning how to cook, nobody teaches you how to run a business. No, they're just like, cook the fucking food, shut the fuck up. Yeah. And then when you get to that point where you're like, all right, I'm ready to open a business. You're like, I don't know anything about fucking opening a business. Dude, it's wild. Yeah. And it's, it's like, there are some days honestly that are so fucking frustrating where I'm just like, man, all I want to do is be in the fucking kitchen with my team and cooking, but I can't cause I got to be on meetings and be on calls and whatever. And the mornings where I can take two or three hours and just put my phone away and just like cook and prep, and like cook some chicken or whatever the fuck we're doing for a catering thing or to get ready for dinner service. I'm like, this is fucking tight. And I'm just like thankful for those little moments. But yeah, man, no one like taught me how to do this shit. Like thankful. Like I just got a business like mentor coach person like over the last month. And she's been teaching me like so much shit and you know, I'm hella thankful for that. But like, yeah, like you can be the best cook in the world, but like, if you don't, or you could have your grandma's like cookie recipe, or you can make the best lobster in the world or the best fucking tacos in the world. But like, if you don't know that you need to like pay your taxes and like do your payroll taxes and have workers comp and liability insurance and all this other shit, like they'll come for you and they'll take your money or they'll take your business and you're fucked. Mm -hmm. You can't just be like, Oh, Hey, like I need, I need an extra two weeks to pay you this like $6,000 mm -hmm. in fucking quarterly taxes. They're like, that fucking interest is going to cut you off at the legs, mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah, man, I mean, I think having a food hall or like some way, you know, a lot of these like business mentorship or like, you know, I'm thankful for La Cocina in San Francisco and like these different groups, but like, Oh, I mean, Oakland needs more of this stuff too. Oakland needs more. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like we, I think the focus was San Francisco for so long yeah. that like, thank God, thank God for James shy about, thank God for him seeing what, what could happen here. And yeah. thank God for all the small business owner hole in the wall places that like survived for fucking years here. Yeah. And also the survive through pandemic. Like, I think Oakland is a beautiful place. I think the people here are beautiful. I think it's got this like calm, serene, soulful feel to it that like I haven't felt in a long time. Like I've lived in a lot of places, man. This is the first apartment that I've ever gotten where I'm like, I'm home. Yeah. Like, welcome. I, I'm home. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and like for the longest time, even in Napa, when I would come down to visit and honestly, pandemic was what happened for me because Truffle Shuffle was in Oakland and I would fucking drive down here in 25 minutes because there was no fucking traffic. No. And I was just, no. any know? time of day. Yeah. Day, night, Monday, yep. Saturday. Yeah. No and just traffic. come down here and, and just feel good. And I was yeah. like, you know, Napa doesn't do that for me. It's beautiful. It's great. And I love to live there. But when I go there, I'm not like, ah. Thank God. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm here. And yeah. Man, and but, I'm home yeah. with these great And that food. doesn't happen anywhere else other than Puerto Rico. Yeah. And to have that here, I'm like, man. Because, you know, again, you're, you're Puerto Rican growing up in the United States. So you're not Puerto Rican enough for your fucking siblings <laughs> down in Puerto Rico. But yeah. you're not fucking, you know, um, black enough for the black community in Connecticut where I grew up. You know? So it's like you got to fucking find your place. Yeah. Um, and... When you when you find it, it's like I'm here. That's yeah. it. So and I can't wait, man. I'm telling you, you're part of it. Jeff Davis is part of it. And all the people, Slug Bar, fucking Snail Bar, like 
the food scene in San Francisco is going to be a fucking destination yeah. in about five to ten years. And I think that the people that are doing it can see it. But there's a lot of people right now that have a lot of doubt. I look at Oakland and they're like, well, what are you going to do? It's like, don't worry, bitch. Yeah. We'll be fine. I mean, really talented chefs from all over the Bay have been like, you know, opening businesses here in Oakland. Yeah. And I mean, I think even over the past several years before the pandemic, I think there was an exodus of chefs like coming over to Oakland. But like, I mean, I've been in Oakland now for, I mean, like, I think I've been in Oakland for like 11 or 12 years now. And, um, just like hella thankful for it, man. Like, and yeah, like I heard about your show from Jeff and Jeff, I think is like, I mean, for those of you that don't know Jeff Davis, just check him out, but he's been the homie for a long time. And like time and time again, that guy continues to make me some of the best meals I've ever had. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them has been at his restaurant. Some of them has, have been at his house, like at his dining room table. But like, I mean, I think like the food scene in Oakland is just going to keep getting better and yeah, better and sure. better. Because the people here uh, can detect bullshit when you're in places in San Francisco that are sort of like, um, you know, there's tech money down there. Yeah. It's all like uh, they don't care. hidden with the money. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah, take, no my, take yeah. my money. Take my here money. Yeah. And when you come here where it's like money means something, yeah. people go out to eat. It should better be fucking good. Yeah. Because if it's not, people can be upset. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's just a it's a difference. And I feel it. You feel it. I think I can't wait to see what the fuck this becomes. Yeah. I think we fucking end this podcast on that note. Yeah, man. Thanks Jeff. for having me. The man over here. Yeah. Like, yeah. Where can we find Tacos at Precioso? Let, let them know. Yeah. So uh, Tacos at Precioso, we're doing the food program at uh, Odin Mezcaleria. I'm going to start that over. Uh, Tacos at Precioso, you can find us at Odin uh, on 4th and Oak in downtown Oakland. Uh, we're doing dinner service there Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights. Uh, we're going to be expanding very soon to another night. But come see us. Thank you very much for all your time. Oakland, I love you. Sucio talk, bitch. We out Let's here. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, also, cheers, man. Salud. Salud. <laughs>